Very well. I'd like to congratulate all our speakers for not only for the excellence of uh, their uh, presentations, but also to strictly remaining uh, in time. While the people is going to the microphone, oh, we have already one question. Let me just, before you ask your question, please identify yourself when you ask your questions. Uh, uh, I'd like to, rise, uh, to, to, to put a question to the people regarding the first movie. Uh, how many people in the audience when perform central compartment neck dissection uh, go up to the hyoid bone in all cases? Please raise the hand. How many don't? Okay. How many go up to the cricoid cartilage? Okay, good. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, Randy Oppenheimer from Arizona. Um, seems to me when I do my central compartment dissections, there's a lot, usually there's a lot of soft tissue, a lot of fat, and there could be multiple nodes. And when you're dissecting all that tissue and you try to identify the inferior parathyroids and you've got nodes around the parathyroid, do you have any suggestions on what do you do with that parathyroid to make sure it's functioning? You want to take that on? Well, if the, the first part of that is to identify whether or not it's indeed the parathyroid, and the best way to do that is to have experience in parathyroid identification. Uh, I, as, as I showed in the, in the film clip, I try to preserve the vascular pedicle. Uh, if you can't identify it, at least try to preserve the superior horn of the, the thymus on which that parathyroid sits, and um, that, that will be a good insurance policy that the vascular pedicle is intact. Apart from that, I don't have any great pearls. Maybe my colleagues here do. I would just uh, say if it looks like it's, uh, it's questionable, that that would be one that I would reimplant. So, Dr. Uh, Fay, what, what exactly is questionable for you? Well, I think if, you, if, it, if it looks ischemic, so if it looks like it's, uh, you know, now it's a dark, blackened uh, gland, uh, doesn't look like a normal parathyroid, that would be one. If you can clearly see that your, the vascular pedicle is gone, uh, that, that would, <clears throat> excuse me, that would be another. And um, if, it, if it is, you know, kind of become a, a dark in color, you can always uh, do like a little capsulotomy, see if there's still any bleeding, uh, and then uh, make a decision at that point. But I think if, again, if, it's, if it looks like it's a non-viable gland, then I would reimplant it. Could I, could I add a little caveat to that or, and a question? Um, you know, think about it. If you see a parathyroid, you take it out, put it on the back table, and look at it 15 minutes later, it looks pretty healthy. So I think we can be fooled. The ones that are blue and black are probably venous obstruction, but the fact that a parathyroid looks okay is not proof that there's good blood supply. Um, but two questions for, for anybody on the panel, really. At a presentation a day or two ago, one of the presenters commented in passing as if it was routine that, of course, before he auto-transplanted the parathyroid, he biopsied it to confirm it. Um, that is not something I did routinely. What about the other members of the panel? No. No. Certainly not so often. I, I just asked uh, uh, Faye what was the rate, and uh, it's much higher than mine. So, but this doesn't mean that I couldn't change my policy. <laughs> Tom, do you biopsy? Uh, virtually never. Virtually uh, it's, never. It's a visual identification. And yeah. what, in, you saw in Dr. Freeman's video, there was a very beautifully identified parathyroid sitting in the upper pole of the thymus. I must confess, I, I didn't see the blood vessel in that situation, there are many people, I think, who advocate when you do a central node dissection, routine autotransplant of the inferior parathyroid. Um, what do you think about that practice? I mean, personally, I think if, you can, if the parathyroid is left on its vascular pedicle, I think it's okay to leave it. But if you if see it just in a bunch of, you know, looks like it's sitting in a fat, in a fat, fatty, uh, a but, you know, bit of fatty tissue without a clear vascular supply, I would reimplant that. Mm -hmm. So it's very good that Dr. Tufano is waiting there because I was just going to mention about the Tufano's node, which is exactly that node that you demonstrated. Mm -hmm. And it's very dangerous to forget about that node and to leave it behind on the right side because 
there is where your recurrence is going to happen. Would you like to comment on that? You. No, I, I've got another comment. Um, just a, a little trick that I've kind of thought up over the years. When a parathyroid starts to turn dark or dusky or black, what I've done is uh, at times taken some papaverin, just much like the uh, microsurgeons do when they put papaverin on microvessels to uh, vasodilate them. And um, m most of the time, that black parathyroid will reassume its original color. So just um, a little pearl for And for some, uh, some uh, uh, heated uh, uh, saline, too, is very useful. Uh, uh, before that, how many people in the audience, please raise your hand, uh, obsessively identify all four parathyroid glands? I mean, really identify all four. Please raise your hand. How many do not necessarily identify all four? Raise your hands. Wow. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that you don't at least try to identify all exactly. four. Exactly. Exactly. I think Dr. Tufano has a question. Ralph Tufano, Baltimore, Maryland. I uh, commend uh, all the presenters on wonderful videos. And I'm just going to put a plug in for a video endocrinology as a forum and an opportunity to show the world really what you're doing. So I would consider submission of these wonderful videos to that uh, journal. Uh, Jeremy, excellent video. Uh, these are reoperative central neck dissections. Maybe I misunderstood you, but I think that I heard that you often do bilateral central neck dissection in a reoperative scenario if you get a good signal on the ipsilateral compartment. And I was wondering if you use preoperative ultrasound, which I gather you do, and the reliability of that ultrasound and telling you that the contralateral compartment, if it's clear, does that really need an operation? Does that really need a dissection? Because I'm also concerned about that 7.2% permanent hypoparathyroidism. And so if the ultrasound is clear and we rely on the ultrasound and we trust the ultrasound, and even if we're missing subclinical microscopic disease, you know, what's the significance of that compared to rendering a patient permanently hypopara? Yes, so I, I do my own ultrasounds. In addition to getting our imagers to do ultrasound, I've, I've found that uh, by and large I'm happier with my own ultrasound. Right. And the, um, your, your point's well taken. Uh, I've often found sub clinical disease on the contralateral side, even in the absence of two ultrasounds done by, by I would say, competent ultrasonographers. So uh, I don't routinely do bilateral central compartment dissection, uh, but oftentimes if they have multiple disease on the ipsilateral side, I will do the contralateral side, or if they've had uh, bad pathology initially or big time disease in terms of volume, Initially, I will do the other side. How often will you find subclinical disease in the contralateral paratracheal region? I don't have, I don't have a number. Uh, we're, we're looking at our, our results constantly, uh, but off the top of my head, I'd say about 10, 15, 20 percent, Let, something of that order. Let me just make a, make a comment that, you know, Jeremy has probably got one of the largest series for revision uh, neck surgery for papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, so his threshold to go to a radiographically negative compartment is one thing, but the average surgeon's desire to go and dissect, I mean, I agree, Ralph, there's nothing but death and misery on that second side. Uh, if, the, if the radiographic evaluation is negative, your benefit there is probably going to be pretty low. And so surgical experience should be dovetailed with that evaluation. Having, having said that, what the clinical implication or the outcome implication of doing the other side is, I don't know. I don't think right. anybody knows. I think you have a comment, Kit? I have a question for, for Jeremy. There are really two kinds of reoperative central neck dissections. Speak on the microphone. Your video, I think, was a patient who had not had a previous central neck dissection. Correct. And I think all of us realize that those are not generally terribly difficult operations, and there's a wealth of literature, including by Dr. Tufano, that shows that those operations can be done very safely. Can you give us some pearls about the patient who has had a previous central neck dissection, where the nerve has, has been dissected out all the way down to the innominate 
and in which you have a sonogram that shows a one centimeter node, whatever. Do you just take out the obvious nodes or do you try to repeat the whole central neck dissection? And as a complement to this question, Jeremy, uh, would, you, would you advocate a backdoor approach instead of going through the midline as you demonstrated? So the answer to that question is I don't do anything different than I showed on that video. Uh, but granted, uh, the redo-redo central neck dissection is much more difficult, um, especially if there's another lobe of thyroid present. I find the presence of a thyroid really induces fibrosis uh, in the central neck and makes it much more difficult. Um, but pretty much the same operation that I showed, but more, much more difficult in terms of fibrous, fibr fibrosis. Ralph. Jeremy, again, uh, you know, I think... You guys are beating up on No, me. no, no, it's a beautiful <laughs> job, and, and I think this is an issue we wrestle with often, is that mobilizing that recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right to get those deeper nodes that Claudia was speaking about and you beautifully illustrated there, whether we transpose that nerve or, as you said, does it need to be on block and you take it separately, and that's something I think we wrestle with. At least we acknowledge that there are nodes posterior to that nerve that we can't just go superficial to it. But I would submit to you that if you mobilize that nerve and you retract the carotid laterally, it allows you to see those retrocarotid lymph nodes a little more inferiorly, which you otherwise may not see and potentially could miss. So just a comment on, on your end to that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, we're not shy about lifting that nerve up and looking under the nerve, uh, as long as you're very careful and meticulous in your dissection. One area that one must be very careful about, and Gary Clayman has written about this, is the area between the nerve and the great vessels, just as uh, just at the thoracic inlet. Oftentimes, uh, metastatic disease goes undetected, and that's an area that should be paid particular attention to. If I can end a sentence with a preposition. And uh, uh, a side comment on uh, the technique on the, the surgery. Uh, when we uh, cut the strap muscles, for instance, for our large goiters, we try to uh, cut it as cranially as possible in order to avoid denervating because the ant enters inferiorly. It's just a, a small detail on the section of the uh, strap muscles. Uh, Professor Mikoli, a quick comment on your wonderful videos. Uh, I noticed, I've been, I had the fortune to be there with you 10 years ago where I, when I learned uh, the technique. And I noticed that this is a new video that you showed. And uh, you uh, situate your incision a little bit more cranially than uh, you did formerly, at least uh, of uh, the time when I was there. Uh, can you comment on that, please? Well, certainly, it also depends upon uh, upon the um, patient by patient. I, uh, so, generally, I say two centimeters above the sternum notch, but it depends upon the length of the. Neck. But that one was higher. Yes. Yes. So I, I'm not I am not concerned about doing the incision even higher because the cosmetic result, in my opinion, is I mean, as higher you stay, the better it is. Okay, and one more question on that. I've been using uh, uh, continuous nerve monitoring, uh, vagal nerve monitoring recently, three years to now, two years to now, and at least in my experience, even in small lobes, the most dangerous part of the thyroidectomy is when you extract the lobe in conventional thyroidectomy because it's exactly when you stretch the Barry's ligament and uh, that's where the nerve uh, is a danger. We just saw a very nice presentation yesterday morning. Uh, could you comment on uh, uh, about this dangerous step of the regular thyroidectomy, the conventional thyroidectomy, uh, compared to the MIVAT when you actually apply uh, significant effort to uh, extract the lobe? Well, I think that uh, as long as you separate, um, separate completely the isthmus and you have performed a correct uh, section of the nerve, I don't think that there is more hazard when extracting the lobe than in conventional uh, thyroidectomy. Yeah, but the problem is not at the isthmus, the problem is laterally. Yes, sure, but uh, you, gain, you gain a lot of mobility when you, super, you separate completely the isthmus and when you separate completely the upper pole of the, of the thyroid. So the point is not only tracing the nerve, but also dividing all the posterior 
uh, vessels which uh, which um, which keep the which keep the upper pole uh, adherent to the trachea. That's the point. If you if you can surround completely the upper pole, you don't stretch the nerve when you extract. Okay, it. Gregory first. Yeah, I think at least in open, I mean, what data we have from nerve monitoring studies looking at when does the injury occur, during what maneuver, what surgical area is loss of signal associated with, it is typically the ligament to bury and one centimeter below. So in other words, neuropraxic injury, about three quarters of all nerve injury are, are stretched at the ligament to bury. And I, I think we're finding that uh, retraction in the plane of the surgical field is tolerated well. This medial retraction of the goiter that Coca described is tolerated well. The lateral strap muscles and the medial thyroid and airway is tolerated very well to expand the lateral thyroid area, but a ventral delivery towards the ceiling is not. And so I've always had concern because this always occurs in slow, orderly process with open surgery just when the superior pole and inferior pole are retracted and you have the V-like remaining connection at the ligament to bury, and you are tracting even a normal degree of thyroid lobe retraction is all communicated to the nerve in one focus, and that's, I think, the mechanism of injury. And so it has always concerned me this precipitous delivery of the lobe ventrally in, in, in minimally invasive uh, uh, approaches as the potential source of traction injury. Very good comment. Jerry, and then we'll hear a question just, by just Dr. Just one Simo. technical point. Um, this may be heretical, but um, I noticed Paulo was using surgical clips. Yes. Um, I, I take it stainless steel clips. Um, titanium. titanium. Titanium clips. Yes. So, you know, I do a lot of high-grade tumors, and, you know, the, a lot of these tumors are prone to um, recurrence or paratracheal recurrence, and I'm just wondering whether or not clips are a, a useful maneuver in, in light of the fact that we're going to be doing cross-sectional imaging and the presence of those clips may invalidate that uh, cross-sectional <coughs> imaging. I'm just taking a straw poll in the audience and just wondered how many of those in the audience routinely use metal clips in their thyroidectomy. Hands up. Uh, I, I use Paramount. clips regularly and I do a lot of revision surgery. Unless you have a cluster of clips, you don't get the x-rays disturbed by that. Isolated clips judiciously applied are not a problem for subsequent cross-sectional imaging. Okay, we have a question. Yeah. Professor Simo? Yeah, Ricard Simo from London. Um, I, so far I've seen uh, four surgeons in the panel, uh, one who use the nerve monitor regularly and, and uh, relig relig religiously another one who does it in difficult cases, another one, I haven't seen any nerve monitoring in their videos. Uh, I mean, for, for a kind of a global audience, uh, I mean, how we should really be going? I know that you guys are very experienced, but in terms of basically teaching a, a young audience, uh, should be using the nerve monitoring, should be, you know, basically encouraging people to use the nerve monitoring. And, and if you don't do it, wh why you should not do it? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Heller? Well, um, I'd like to answer that even though I know you really would like Dr. Randolph to answer it. But I come at this from the perspective of having been doing this for over 35 years and of being a real skeptic. Um, I was opposed to nerve a monitoring. A real skeptic. <laughs> I was opposed to nerve monitoring. I know how to find the recurrent nerve. And it took me a long time to begin to use it. And I have become a believer, not that I think it decreases the incidence of permanent or perhaps even transient nerve injury, but it has a number of advantages, not the least of which, particularly with cancers, and particularly as we realize that total thyroidectomy is not mandatory in every patient. Perhaps you would prefer it, but I think we're learning that a lobectomy is probably okay for the majority of our patients, at least in the U.S., where we see very many low-risk patients. That decision to go to the second side cannot be made safely without knowing the status of the nerve on the first side. And Greg has shown this, and everybody else has shown it, that demonstrating an intact nerve does not prove intact function. So I'll just briefly, briefly add that 
there are advantages. You should become familiar with it. Then you can decide to what extent you want to use it. Do you want to use it in every case? But these advantages, really, you can't just read about it. You have to explore it. There are some advantages. It is more information. And, and then you can decide what kind of cases you want to use it in. Can I, can I just add that I, I use uh, nerve monitoring selectively, certainly on all reoperative cases and in any case where there's a question of uh, of uh, prior uh, nerve injury. Um, I have a real, con the question was posed about the young people in the audience, and I have a real concern about educating people to depend on a machine to, to, uh, to find the nerve. Um, machines can sometimes be wrong, sometimes the connection goes wrong, and if you're not able to identify the nerve visually and use the machine to confirm it, all the people up here and many in the room have done, you know, hundreds or thousands of thyroidectomies and, you know, your experience. And, and using it at, at this point in my career, it's, you know, it, sometimes it's very nice. You see the nerve, you say, oh, it's great, it works. Uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable. But to, to have learned the technique to say, oh, I'm going to take this probe and find it that way, I have concerns about uh, that going forward for our younger uh, I have a final announcement to make. The, the president's reception, which is for everyone, not only for the presidents, I was asked to tell you that, uh, uh, is going to be uh, held uh, exactly on this uh, space here uh, at 7 o'clock. And as my boss in the scientific committee is right there uh, looking at me, we have to conclude the session. I'd like to call a round of applause for our presenters here. Thank you very much.